Well, good morning, gentlemen. I think we may or may not have another fella coming, Sandra just told me. So, anyway, my name is Reggie Kimbrough, and I know two of you very well, and two of you not at all. Um, so, maybe I can get a name or two here first. Doug Payne. Doug Payne? Is he a Payne? I know that's probably the oldest joke since you were in diapers. Uh, sorry to reuse it. Doug, right? And Mark Lopez. Mark Lopez. I think I know your folks from, well, let's just say a few years ago, the 70s. I think maybe before they were married is when I would have been in the same general ballpark with them at the Wilds and so forth. So, sorry and all that reminiscing. I missed it. Mark, Mark, Doug, and you're my son-in-law, and you're Andrew Farr. Okay, um, well, this is, of course, an Acts. If that's where you're expecting to be, you're in the right place. If it's not, then, uh, well, stick around, see what happens. Um, a few things by way of introduction. Uh, we're going to meet for four days this week and four days next week, and that will finish what is going to be a brief course, a short module, two-hour course, and probably not the hardest course you'll have at Geneva Seminary. So I'll expect all kind of awards and gifts by the end of this class uh, for making it easy on you. The hardest part's going to be staying awake, uh, talking to me or listening to me, but hopefully not. But uh, I must confess... Uh, I enjoy teaching, but it's a little bit frustrating uh, doing it once every other year, and uh, this is the second time through this course, so I'm a little happier about that, but I still, when the classes are different and the interaction is different as to how many questions and the discussion, um, it can greatly affect how much material you cover in a day or in an hour or whatever, so it... Uh, I just think it would be nice to teach where you're teaching for one hour, three days a week, and you know exactly what's going to happen. It's your 12th time through it, and uh, nobody's going to ask a question you've never heard asked before. Uh, I don't live in that world yet, so. Greetings. Is Chris, is that right? Yeah. Or you actually remember the name. That's not my forte, so. <laughs> anyway. All right. Let me go ahead and give you guys some of these uh Sandy has prepared these. I hope um, these are going to look different than mine, so I've got to learn what's here myself. I sent files down, and then she made them look good. So, But it's like straightening my room or my desk. Whenever I straighten it, I can't find anything. When it's a mess, I know where everything is. All right, um, Mr. Farr. Uh, the first thing is a course syllabus that is uh, required for me to turn in, give you a general idea of where we're headed. Um, I have been very general myself as we progress along and said selected expositions because I don't know where will be what day, so I just started putting it that way so we, well, we can say we're on target pretty much all the time. Um, as, and i got to work through what is in your packet. There are several things. Let me just tell you first off uh, what you're probably interested in, and that's uh, the points and what the requirements are. Uh, I really wrestled with giving you a paper, um, but two weeks is not a long time. I am giving you one of the primary assignments is chapter content. We'll say more about that in a minute. So uh, I've forgone a paper, and instead of doing that this time, I'm going to give you two quizzes. So you're going to have two quizzes. Both of those will occur this week. And then a, a final test uh, Thursday of next week. Uh, next Thursday, we'll just have the test. Um, it's a, we're losing a little class time that way, but I don't think it's pretty fair or very fair to lecture you for a uh, couple of hours and then give you a test for the last hour uh, on stuff you just heard and so forth. So next Thursday will be uh, just the test. But uh, if you look through what I've given you there, uh, let's just get a couple of things out. There's a chapter content sheet. 
and um, I have given you kind of a rough summary of the chapter content so you can work from this. Um, chapter content is going to be a, a big chunk of your final exam. Maybe I've got to rework the exam still for this class to reflect what we do and don't get done, but uh, I think last time. Okay, the chapter content. If you got that sheet there, just grab a hold of that and uh, spend some time with that because uh, you'll need to be familiar with that come next Thursday. So um, I think before Windows beeped at me, uh, I was saying that probably the chapter content will come somewhere between a quarter and a third of the final exam points. So that's a significant part of, of your coursework. So I also want you to uh, read the book of Acts uh, two times through at least during the class. That's not a major thing once a week uh, here. And I'll just have a question on the exam if ask you if you've done that. So you can uh, tell me the truth, yay or nay, and either get your points or miss them, or you can lie to me and get your points, and, well, you have to live with that. Um, but anyway, so reading two times through, just to be familiar with the book and uh, spend time in it while we're in it here, and then the chapter content are two main requirements. And then also, I have given you, and I think they're in your packet already that I handed you, uh, two handouts. One of them, the thicker of the two, and I'm hoping, I got her to print these from a website. This is available several places. Um, if you're familiar with this, I'll just go ahead and mention this quickly. Um, we're going to spend a little time uh, this week in the class uh, dealing with some of the, I guess you'd say, more charismatic questions. Uh, Acts is a place where these questions come up. So uh, I've given you uh, a printout here, The Cessation of the Charismata by B.B. Uh, Warfield. Uh, this is a chapter, the opening chapter I believe, but a, a, a good portion of his little book, Counterfeit Miracles. Uh, the book goes further than this. This deals with the extraordinary gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament. Uh, Warfield's book goes further than that, and he goes through church history and surveys the appearance and disappearance of claims of the miraculous, uh, particularly comes to focus on the Roman Catholic Church's claim of miracles through the years. But we're just going to deal with this one portion. So instead of giving you the book to get, um, it's a paperback. I think Banner keeps it in print periodically. But uh, this is available online, and I just thought we'd print it out and have it all on the same page number. Uh, I want you to read this article, and don't be overly scared because I think about half of what you're holding there is the footnotes. Uh, I just, mine just fell open to page, there's 27 pages. I think the article goes to page 16. And then the footnotes are from page 17 to 27. So you got... Uh, about as much notes as you've got text, um, but the article itself isn't as thick as it feels like it is. So I want you to read this one tonight, and we're going to have a, a brief quiz or a quiz on this tomorrow. Um, then there's another one that's there. It's an article by Dr. Barrett. You probably, if you've had his Minor Prophets, or so, I don't know how it's cataloged, but you may see this from another direction in your time here in Geneva, but uh, just in case or as repetition aids learning, uh, I want you to read this one and be ready for a quiz on this on Thursday. So these two handouts and quizzes on them uh, this week. We'll have a quiz on Warfield tomorrow and on Barrett on um, Thursday. I keep wanting to say Friday because it's the last day we meet and my brain's wired that way. Um, also, you've got uh, a handout on introductory material. This is what we're going to be spending time on uh, this morning. And then another one I'll just mention, this will come up. This one, OT quotations and acts. This is strictly a four-year information 
handout. You won't be required anything on this. Um, it's just during the lecture today, I think we'll touch that part of the lecture, uh, I'm going to comment on the relationship between Acts and the Old Testament. And I just had this printed out. Uh, you can get it down to one page. I was having a little problem with my computer, uh, which Sandra helped me fix. But I got a new computer a couple of weeks ago. My other one was dying. And I had some button clicked wrong. And I, these are single spaced, but there was another button that needed to be corrected. But anyway, this OT quotation sheet, again, is not something you're going to be accountable for in any way. It's just for you to have. And I took this, you'll see at the top out of the book, uh, OT Quotations in the New Testament. It's a survey by Gleason Archer and others. I think the Ed Al got dropped there. But anyway, uh, that's just for your information. And um, I trust you'll see the significance of that list uh, for Acts. Okay, what have I got to do still? Um, I need to find a pen for myself. Mike, I'm probably driving people nuts on the video already. I haven't been in the camera, but uh, a few seconds of the time. But uh, hopefully I'll correct that. All right, I'm going to get this down here. I got... All right, Tim, Chris, Doug. I was getting there. Mark and Andrew. Okay. Um, I'm going to trust that we're doing okay over there. Um, we're going to meet from 9 to 12.15 every day. Is that a problem for anybody? I know we're here today, but everybody okay with that schedule? Anybody rather meet from 5 a.m. to 8.15? Uh, I got one thumbs up and <laughs> two really scared blank stares. Uh, no, you won't need to worry. I'm not going to be voting for 5 a.m. myself. Uh, but 9 to 12.15, and we'll probably take a 15-minute break from 10.30 to 10.45 each day if we can try and stay on that schedule. And how to get everybody to wake up and wake the teacher up. I can go eat some of my crackers and contraband and come back and hang together for another hour and a half. Um, well, I've come in and a wonderful thing to teach a course in Bible and I didn't bring my Bible. Uh, I mean, I did bring my Bible, but I didn't bring the one I want to have with me, but um, that's okay. Well, for all of that uh, lengthy introduction, um, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get underway. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for thy kindnesses to us and that the word reminds us that your mercies are new every morning. Well, Lord, we reckon upon those mercies this day and thank thee for those already seen. We pray for help in this course. Lord, again, we ask that you will help us to be mindful that though this is a classroom setting, uh, we are here to Consider and study thy word. And we ask that you would give us grace, and that it will be a profitable and an enjoyable time for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if you will take the handout that is entitled Introductory Material, um, this is probably the only lecture that I will give you the lecture. Um, I'm kind of an old school guy, as you'll know by if you see me fumbling with a computer trying to figure out uh, what it does and doesn't do. Um, most of the lecture, I'm just going to be giving you lecture and getting you to take your own notes. But in the introductory material, there's so many things that are more detailed. Um, it's better to just have it there. And there's several quotes that I've put in here for you that certainly be difficult to get put down in that type of setting. So anyway, this one we've got handed out. So we're just going to work through this here. Please, um, during this and any other time, uh, feel free to interrupt me and um, ask a question or we can, 
I think sometimes in class discussion is the most profitable because that's what you're thinking about and you learn more when you're thinking about what you're doing. So anyway, but uh, we'll just work through this and get underway. Uh, the place of the book of Acts in the New Testament canon we're seeing here has been unchallenged since the earliest times. Now, there have been liberals that have raised objections, but even these scholars, uh, that frame of mind, have found very little ammunition uh, with which to criticize the book. Acts is not one of those problem uh, books in the New Testament. But I put in a couple of quotes here because the importance of the book of Acts would be difficult to overstate. Uh, it is an essential backdrop between the Gospels and the Epistles. Uh, I think you'll find, if you or as you become more and more familiar with the book of Acts, that the Epistles will come to life uh, in a very different way. I even found this time, I was preaching during the last year in the book of Acts, knowing this course was coming. I spent a lot of time on Google Earth, <laughs> you know, looking oh, where Paul was, a pretty big hill there Paul had to climb that day. Uh, you can almost literally get to that point with Google Earth these days, particularly if you go to Ephesus, because the theater at Ephesus is still exposed. And uh, you can click down there, and we could probably do it in here if I knew how to navigate Mr. Simmons' computer, but we'll let everybody do that on their own. Um, but anyway, um, Acts, as I said, is a, is a backdrop uh, between the Gospels and the Epistles. And uh, there are some things in Acts that... We have questions about, particularly as we go through here today, uh, you know, why it ends where it does and so forth. We'll talk about that. But um, it's a vital book. And I've put, given you a couple of quotes here that I found interesting. Farrar says this, The preciousness of a book may sometimes be estimated if we consider the loss that we would experience if we didn't possess it. If so, we can hardly value the Acts of the Apostles too much. If it had not come down to us, there would have been a blank in our knowledge which scarcely anything else would have filled up. And now, even a liberal scholar, if the book of Acts were gone, there'd be nothing to replace it. And we may go further that the Christian scriptures would then lie before us in two disjointed fragments. The complete arch would not be built. Now, from different frames of mind, uh, all are agreeing this is an important book if we're going to understand the New Testament. And uh, that's actually a, an aspect of Acts that kind of sank into me later on. You know, you, I wanted to you know, dive into the epistles, get into Romans, Galatians, learn all the doctrine, and this is all vital and necessary. Uh, but Acts is a vital part of our New Testament scripture. I've just given you a couple suggested titles. You've probably heard these and others. Uh, the Acts of the Apostles is the most common title that we find in most Bibles. Uh, the Acts of the Holy Spirit have been suggested by some. Others have suggested the Acts of the Risen Christ. Uh, Stott's suggestion is the continuing words and deeds of Jesus by His Spirit through His Apostles. Uh, that almost brings us into the realm of puritanical uh, introductions and uh, lengthy titles. But uh, I just threw those out there. Uh, there's nothing vital that you need to know there. But uh, as we get into the, I guess, general questions of introduction, uh, we'll spend a little time here today. The authorship of the book. Uh, Acts is written. We understand and believe by Luke. Uh, Luke, the author of the third gospel. If you uh, suggest or if you investigate that, you see quite easily both of these books are dedicated to an individual named Theophilus. Uh, Acts, as it opens, makes mention of the first treatise, the former treatise, most excellent Theophilus, uh, Luke begins. Um, there's strong similarities of language and style. We'll see that as we go forward. Uh, both contain common interests. There are certain things Luke uh, is careful to point out. Luke, the physician, uh, takes note of certain things. And the Acts naturally follows on from Luke's gospel. So the suggestion or the search into the question of authorship, um, certainly the connection between Luke and Acts leads us directly to conclude Luke is the author. 
Secondly, tradition that supplies Luke as the author. From the second century, uh, that is the Muratorian fragment, the writings of the fathers give a united testimony to Luke's authorship. Uh, and I've given you a couple of quotes here. I don't know that we'll take time to read through these. Let me pause, though. I, I should have done this before. Um, commentaries on Acts. Uh, just suggesting to you, I found uh, two or three that have been very helpful. Uh, if you want a standard, uh, old standby type of commentary, uh, J.A. Alexander, uh, that's in the Geneva series uh, on Acts, the old Princeton school. Uh, excellent commentary, uh, very thorough. Um, more contemporary commentaries, uh, Simon Kistemaker in the New Testament commentary series with William Hendrickson. I have to... I guess throw in an apology here. I've always said when I recommend that, and I highly recommend that set. Um, that's a, that's a wonderful New Testament commentary. But I've often said that um, I like Hendrickson a lot better than Kistemaker, and that's still generally true. But I have to say, I found Kistemaker very helpful uh, in studying for Acts. It seemed that we were on the same wavelength a lot of times. If you look up something, you have a question, and you open the commentary, and they don't say anything about it, and then you you open and a commentator starts dealing with things you've questioned, you, you kind of get in his zone. But there are a lot of helpful things. I thought his introductory material was good. I've given you a big quote here from him. Uh, I'm going to mention another one, and I'm going to have to give a big caveat here. Uh, I have really enjoyed um, John R. Stott's commentary on uh, Acts. It's in the Bible Speaks Today series. Stott was, I think, at least the New Testament editor of that. This is where we get into the issues of new evangelicalism, compromise, etc., etc. Stott uh, has been in more in ecumenical circles. He was, if you look some of the history, if you read Ian Murray's book, uh, Evangelicalism Divided, the division between Stott and Lloyd-Jones, uh, the Lausanne Conference in 74, whatever it was, Stott was the evangelical, but more of the ecumenical Anglican format. Uh, Stott particularly came, uh, I don't know, I think there's been more discussion on this than I'm familiar with, but Stott uh, embraced annihilationism. He was denier of hell, which is back in the news big now, because uh, if you're familiar with Rob Bell, fellow in Grand Rapids, Michigan, has just come out with a book called Love Wins, where he denies the doctrine of hell. Um, I don't know in the new format in Geneva if I'm going to teach the eschatology stuff anymore. I hope I get to teach a little bit of it, but um, I had a requirement when I taught that in the past to read W.G.T. Shedd's book, uh, The Doctrine of Endless Punishment. Shedd has a powerful uh, paragraph early in the book where he argues that without the doctrine of hell we don't have a gospel this is nothing that we're saved from and uh, he concludes that the attempt to maintain the evangelical faith without it is futile um, so anyway here's a leader of the millennial generation um, I know a little bit about his church Mars Hill and in, in near Byron Center Grand Rapids area of Michigan my brother-in-law pastored in Byron Center for about 15 plus years uh, and that church evolved while he was there and uh, there's a lot of history there um, but anyway I say all that to say Stott has some problems from from where I stand as a free Presbyterian minister in the ecumenical questions some of those theological questions. So big caveat there. But having said that, uh, I really love to read Stott. Uh, I found in his commentaries, um, and a lot of these, they would say, are not technically commentaries. You're not going to go and, like in um, J. Alexander's book, you know, verse by verse, every verse has a paragraph and you deal with the terms. Uh, he doesn't handle it that way. It's more of an overview. I mean, obviously you got 400 or 500 pages worth or 300 and right at 400 pages of overview here. Um, there's a lot of material, but uh, I've really enjoyed reading Stott while I was preaching through the book, uh, and I'd really recommend that um, commentary to you. Um, 
Right, so we're back here to the section on page one still, the tradition. I'll just give you a couple of quotes here that uh, the, the tradition on Luke being the author um, is very strong. And Guthrie, uh, that second quote I give you, uh, well, we'll just read that one. Uh, he says, The voice of the ancient church is unanimous in ascribing this book to Luke, the author of the third gospel. Irenaeus, in quoting passages from it, repeatedly uses the following formula. Luke, the disciple and follower of Paul, says thus. Clement of Alexandria, quoting Paul's speech in Athens, introduced it by saying, So Luke and the Acts of the Apostles relates. Eusebius says, and he gives a quote from Eusebius, The external testimony for Luke and authorship is as strong as we could wish for. Sorry, this is Burkhoff I'm reading now. Uh, and then Guthrie, I put just the tail end of a quote from him. He says, moreover, at no time were any doubts raised regarding this attribution to Luke, and certainly no alternatives were mooted. The tradition could hardly be stronger. So, like I said, Acts is not one of those uh, questionable New Testament books. Critics and conservatives as well, unless the more radical critics that are putting it way out there as a second century document and so forth. Um, but Luke as the author from tradition is very strong. So then we look at the internal evidence here on page two. Uh, the author was a companion of Paul. Uh, you get into uh, the latter portion of the book and you have what is a significant uh, aspect of studying Acts, what are called the we sections. Uh, they're portions in which the writer changes person. And he starts writing in the first person plural. We went here, we went there, we got on this boat and did that. Uh, and it's interesting where those start and stop. And you can pick up as you go through the story where Luke met Paul, when Luke was with Paul, when Luke was away from Paul, and when Luke was back with Paul. Um, Luke was Paul's great companion. If you look in Second Timothy, Paul's last epistle where he's imprisoned and his final trial and his impending death is there. He says, only Luke is with me. Um, and I think that's interesting. Uh, it's possible Luke was there because of their friendship, their years in working together. But uh, Luke's also the physician. Uh, and maybe Luke was there in particular because Paul had need of his help. Uh, but the we sections uh, are a big portion uh, of Acts or an important aspect of Acts. The writer is claiming and noting that he was there and with Paul for the things he was writing about. So if you come to, again, the question of authorship in the we section, this means that none of the companions of Paul that are named in the we sections can be the writer. So this eliminates Silas, it eliminates Timothy, it eliminates Sobater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Um, those men are named in the particular we sections, so none of those fit. So this leaves only Mark, Justice, Epaphras, Demas, Epaphroditus, and Luke as remaining possibilities. Demas seems to be uh, out of the running because of his apostasy. Mark doesn't fit the pictures. The book of Acts is linked with the third gospel, and we know Mark wrote the second gospel, so that puts him out, and Mark was with Barnabas in Acts 15, so he couldn't have been the one that found Paul at Philippi in chapter 16. Uh, and so also Mark's name doesn't appear as one that's with Paul during the writing of the prison epistles. So of all these remaining, uh, Morris concludes, there seems no reason for thinking any of those apart from Luke uh, would be the author. So uh, the authorship of Luke is relatively well settled. Um, I put in a little note here, a note on sources, that there's an interesting neglect of Paul's epistles. Let me just pause here. I always get a little nervous when you are talking about Scripture and then people bring up sources. Um, we believe that the source of Scripture is the Spirit of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, in believing criticism, we can recognize some use of source material. Um, for instance, in Acts, there are going to be letters that are recorded, some of the correspondence between the Roman authorities during Paul's trials. Well, Luke could have had a copy of one of those letters. He could have had somebody write it down as it was presented in the court or whatever. That type of source material, we're not 
having a problem with as conservatives. Um, so there's no, no problem there. But the point here I'm making is some have commented that uh, there's this neglect of Paul's epistles, uh, the ones that were already available by the time Acts was written. Well, to me, that neglect is almost uh, an indication uh, of the value and the fact that Luke didn't need these. He had even more direct source material. He was an eyewitness to many of the events that he's recording. And so there's no need of this other source material. Um, uh, yes, I was thinking about pausing there and heading somewhere else in the text. But, um, well, let me just do that while we're here. Um, if you look in the opening of Luke's Gospel, and I am going to be in a world of hurt since I didn't bring in my other Bible. When you get old, your eyes begin to uh, do different things than they used to do. I should say more accurately, not do things that they used to do, like focus on small print that's in front of your face. Um, listen to the prologue or the introduction to Luke's Gospel. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke mentions other gospel writers and other traditions, other suggestions and writings of the things that are included here. It seemed good to him to write down, having had perfect understanding of them, it says, from the very first. You might want to mark or consider that term from the very first there. The term can be translated from above, an oathen. It actually appears in John 3, uh, born again. It can be understood, born from above. Uh, and if that's the case, if that's the sense that the word would take here, uh, Luke is, in essence, claiming inspiration for what he's writing, having had perfect understanding of these things from above. Um, but the prologue to Luke is important. Uh, it was one commentator brought out, and again, I always hesitate in drawing all the parallels between other ancient literature and scripture, but that it was common if different volumes were being written, that the first of those would introduce all of them. So for Acts, you would go back and read the prologue to Luke as part of the introduction. The prologue to Acts reflects back to that. He's addressing it to the same person. He said, the former treatise, what I wrote you the first time, and now I'm writing you again to follow up. So anyway, okay, back to the notes here, page two. When I go over here, and uh, I'm assuming I'm still in good shape on the computer. Um, some biographical information on Luke himself. Uh, a note here from Burkhoff's New Testament introduction. The only certain knowledge we have of Luke is derived from the Acts of the Apostles and from a few passages in the Epistles of Paul. From Colossians 4.11 and 14, it appears that he was not a Jew, and that his worldly calling was that of a physician. Eusebius and Jerome state that he was originally from Antioch in Syria, which may be true, but it's also possible that their statements due to a mistaken derivation of the name Luke from Lucius in Acts 13.1 instead of Lucanus. The testimony of origin makes us suspect this. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I'm going to read all of this for you. Um, Skip down, he says, apparently the evangelist joined the company of Paul and his co-laborers on the second missionary journey at Troas. You know, I should have looked here. I thought I was going to have more time before class, but um, I need to look through our maps. Um, staring at a map and Acts is very helpful at times. Um, it's been suggested, too. Let me see what map I've got here. There we go. Sorry. Uh, anyway, Troas is where we first find Luke with Paul. And that's where the we section starts. 
Some have suggested because when Paul goes to Philippi and then journeys beyond Philippi, Luke stays there. Uh, that maybe Luke was from Philippi. Uh, we may talk more about that when we get to that point, but some have suggested here that he was from uh, another place. And again, Burkhoff is challenging that, but not vital, uh, but just an interesting question. I put a little thing here at the bottom of page two, significance. I was frankly surprised years ago when I learned this. If I were to ask you today, who wrote most of the New Testament? Which New Testament writer wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? What would you say? What? Paul. We would all probably say Paul. Because if you do a list of books, well, Paul's got the most. I even include Hebrews in that too. So, uh, But, okay, number of books, yes, Paul wins hands down. But, actual amount of material, Luke. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. Now that to me is pretty, was pretty staggering to consider. But if you look at the Gospel of Luke, it's the longest of the Gospels, uh, and you look at the book of Acts and you consider its length, 28 chapters, and some of those chapters are somewhat lengthy, uh, Luke wrote a lot of material. And this is not a scientific survey, we hear that said all the time, but in my Cambridge Bible that has no notes, so it's just text on every page, I just did a little unscientific survey, and my New Testament's 336 pages long, uh, 92 of those pages are Luke and Acts combined. So that is just 20 pages short of a third of the New Testament that Luke wrote. So, uh, it's not an insignificant part of our Bibles. Um, now, let me just pause here too. We're talking about Luke. Luke is one of the, shall we say, non-apostolic writers of the New Testament. Um, I remember being in seminary with a fellow that had done um, his undergrad work in something other than Bible. And uh, I made a comment in class one day about John Mark being the author of Mark's gospel, and I thought the guy was going to fall out of his chair. He, said, he wrote the gospel of Mark? Yeah. Um, but in the New Testament era, the gift of prophecy uh, was prevalent in the church. And I think from that standpoint, we have the same type of situation as in the Old Testament. Uh, God's Spirit would come upon prophets. I mean, you take Amos. He was a herdsman from Tekoa. Uh, he wasn't this, you know, priestly pedigree and never had been anything but a minister and so forth. Um, others were used of the Lord in the penning of his word. And we can, in a sense, say the same is true and not a problem for the New Testament. But to go a little further than that, even though we have, like in James and Jude, I believe the half-brothers of the Lord, uh, not in that apostolic band of the Twelve, but yet very near and eyewitnesses of these things. Um, but when we come to John Mark and Luke, we're looking at companions of the apostles, co-laborers. And we're familiar with the hiccup, shall we say, between John Mark and Paul and the rift between Paul and Barnabas. Um, John Mark went with Barnabas, but it's evident as we go through the little snippets we see in the rest of the New Testament that John Mark spent a good deal of time with Peter. And in the Lord's providence, what an interesting pairing. Peter the one who said, I'll never deny the Lord, and then a few hours later, three times with cursing, uh, he denies the Lord. Uh, well, what a companion to help John Mark to go on and recognize that you know there is... Um, grace and there is forgiveness and there is restoration. Um, Mark, in many ways, we look at as Peter's gospel. Um, Mark, the companion of Peter. Well, in that sense, when we look at Luke, uh, the book there are the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, in many ways, Luke is Paul's gospel. Uh, and Acts is, even though Luke deals with Peter and the other events of necessity, Paul becomes the hero in the latter half of Acts. And so that's where the focus is. Um, so I think that's an interesting perspective when you read those Gospels. Mark being Peter's, Luke being Paul's. Um, anyway, 
Right. Uh, so that's the authorship again. Nobody, uh, unless they're pretty far left in the critical realm, is questioning. Luke is the author, but that little bit of information that narrows it down and helps us to learn a little about Luke himself. Um, so back to the notes, page three, the date. Um, it suggests here that Luke is the author isn't a minor point. The fact that he's the author places the book right in the days of the apostles, and it argues for an early date for the book. There's no reference to the fall of Jerusalem. Again, this is arguing from silence, but that's such a significant event, and given that this is a historical book, it leads us pretty strongly toward the conclusion that it was written before that happened. Uh, there's no reference to Nero's persecution. That Luke writes regarding the parting from the Ephesian elders with sadness and emotion, uh, it would seem a little out of place if Luke knew that they were going to see them again, or if Paul intended to or had visited Ephesus again which appears happened, uh, as we learn from the pastoral epistles in First Timothy. So it seems that, again, that's pushing us earlier on in Paul's experience and in, his, um, or in Luke's writing here. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the abrupt ending. Uh, the, well, let me stare at my notes here just a second. Well, there's a, another matter we're going to get to. I, I changed these notes from last time. Uh, I may get repetitive if I get into it now, but we'll see. Uh, but the abrupt ending uh, suggests, too, that the book takes us up to the time of its writing. The fact that it seems to end abruptly uh, doesn't mean, well, it got chopped in half or Luke was going to write something else. That's a little part we're going to touch on here later. Uh, there's some that suggest, as we'll see, that Luke was planning a third volume. The Gospel was volume one, Acts is volume two, and then volume three was still to come. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical on that suggestion, even though it makes me skeptical of something that B.B. Warfield said. Uh, that's pretty scary. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, the fact that it ends abruptly, though, does help us a little bit in, in this question about the date. It, that seems to indicate that it brought us up to that point in time. So Paul's first imprisonment in Rome after that perilous journey from Jerusalem uh, that Luke spends so much time on there at the end, um, it seems to be that starts to focus us on the time of its writing. <coughs> um, there are others that still focus on that time of the two-year imprisonment as the marker and they date the book at A.D. 63. Uh, you'll see among conservatives usually a one or two year variation at times in some of their New Testament dates, but Warfield and Kistemaker use 63 as uh, their fixed point. And I've given you um, a quote here from Burkhoff. Um, well, we'll just we'll take time and read that one. It must have been written after 63 since the author knows that Paul stayed in Rome two years, but how long after that date was it written? Among conservative scholars, such as Alfred Salmon, Bruce, or Barty, I'm sorry, and others, the opinion is generally held that Luke wrote his second book before the death of Paul and the destruction of Jerusalem, because no mention of whatever is made of either of these important facts. Zahn and Weiss naturally dated about A.D. 80, since they regard this date as a terminus ad quem for their composition of the third gospel. Many of the later rationalistic critics, too, are of the opinion the book was written after the destruction of Jerusalem, some placing it as late as A.D. 110 and 120. The reasons for doing this are, one, the supposed dependence of Luke on Josephus, which we would not hold, the assumption based on Luke 21 and Acts 8 that Jerusalem was already destroyed. I think that's a misreading of those texts and the supposed fact that the state of affairs in the book points to a time when the state had begun to persecute Christians on political grounds. None of these reasons are conclusive, and we see no reason to place the book later than A.D. 63. The place of composition was in all probability Rome. Um, I've given you a note here. Um, I think, I, at least I find this interesting. If you look at Luke's gospel, really the gospel, all the gospels, but you look at Luke's gospel in particular as volume one, uh, Luke and Acts each cover a period of approximately 33 years. Uh, the gospel from a couple years A.D. or B.C. rather, if we are working our dates right in the birth of Christ, to about A.D. 30. 
you got about a 33-year period the gospel covers. Then you've got about a 33-year period that Acts covers from the ascension of Christ to about 63. Then if you jump to look at John's writings, the book of Revelation in particular, if we're correct in dating that, although the Reconstructionists are working hard to get us all to date Revelation prior to A.D. 70. There's a fellow here in town. Uh, my name, part of my brain's turned off, but it's usually not turned on anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, is it Gentry? Is he here in town? Kenneth Gentry? Is he the one that's written before Jerusalem fell? One of them's working on another degree at the school I'm working in in Wales, and I think he's doing it on Revelation again. But... Um, that's something that to me is, uh, I'm not a Reconstructionist in any stretch, and I think theonomy is in many ways to post-millennialism what dispensationalism is to premillennialism, uh, a modern uh, perversion of an older view. Um, but that's another topic. But if Revelation is written after the fall of Jerusalem, their whole scheme of eschatology crumbles. Uh, and that's why uh, they're very jealous to make that early date. Um, to me, if your whole eschatological viewpoint falls based on a date of a book, you might have a problem. Um, but, but anyway, all that to say, the traditional and I think more accurate uh, dating for Revelation is mid, in the mid-90s. And one reason for that, I think, if you look at the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, the level of false teaching, uh, spiritual coldness and Ephesus, all these factors that are rebuked in those seven letters, um, that's a lot of territory to cover in a period of, you know, five or ten years. The apostle comes, there's preaching, there's revival, there's the influx of souls, there's evangelism that's spreading throughout, and then those seven letters. Boy, you, you, you really did a lot in a hurry. Uh, I think those seven letters are indicative of the later date for Revelation. Uh, but anyway, back to the point here, I just find it interesting. If you, if you do that, then if you look at the Gospels, you got about a 33-year period, roughly a generation. If you look at Acts, it covers from about 30 to 63. You've got another 33-year period, another generation. Then if you go from that point in time to where we come in Paul's writings and those epistles and Revelation in particular, that I say Paul, I meant just to say John, um, you've got another 33 years. So that takes you into the second generation of New Testament church history first of those being the life of Christ, the second of those being first generation of the church, what Acts covers, and then the indication, the information we get from John about that second generation. So I think that's an interesting little two or three, basically 33-year blocks of time uh, that are partitioned off in the New Testament. Um, Bottom of page three, some historical markers. Uh, I've given you two, basically two outlines here, one from Kistemaker. Um, we won't work through this, but uh, he gives us some dates and some particulars. Um, then I've given you another timeline. This is by Colin Hemmer. Uh, this is modified and used by Stott in his commentary. I wish I could have gotten these. The, the second one here probably is a little more helpful. Uh, there's some... Um, you know, some uh, historical stuff in the one by Kistemaker, but the one here by Hemmer, uh, in my text, it's, there's spacing. There's a lot more spacing on the right side of the Roman Empire so that each of them is next to the same time frame in the other column. To get it to fit here, that doesn't that doesn't follow. There's not, if you go straight across, you're not looking at the same year necessarily. But uh, these events, there's one of them in particular. Uh, some of these you can fix by the amount of time. You know, Paul went here, he stayed here about this long. We can start doing estimates in that way. But there's one date in New Testament study that is a real anchor. Uh, and if you look over in the right column under the Roman Empire, 51 to 52, 
there's accurate record of when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, 51 to 52. And here, um, when Paul is in Corinth, uh, we know Paul's in Corinth during this time, if you go over to the other column. So with that fixed date, uh, conveniently pretty close to the middle of the, the dating of these things in Acts, um, it, it's a good New Testament place to point anchor when you're uh, working through the dates. But anyway, I've given you these two different timelines. Um, don't uh, waste a lot of time memorizing material from these two timelines. Uh, that's not something I want you to have to spend time on. just wanted you to have it available. Um, right. The style. Luke is able to express himself in excellent Greek, but in Acts he varies the choice of words with reference to the locale. He reflects the diction, vocabulary, and culture of the ideas, or excuse me, the area he describes. Hence, in the chapters that depict Palestine, Luke's Greek has an Aramaic coloring. The second half of the book reflects a Gentile setting and is written in fluent Greek that at times rivals classical Greek. To illustrate, of the 67 times that the optative mood occurs in the New Testament, 17 are in Acts. These 17 instances appear mostly in the second half of the book and often come from the lips of speakers who knew Greek well. Uh, Kistemaker's comments there. Um, I put you a little note here that I find interesting with reference to our views of inspiration. Paul's quotation of Luke 10 in 1 Timothy 5.18 he links a quotation from Deuteronomy with that quotation, apparently clearly from Luke's Gospel, under the same description as the Scripture. And so we have a similar thing uh, with Peter uh, talking about Paul, uh, where he says, Paul also has written to you in his epistles some things which are hard to be others understood, which those that are unstable do rest or twist the Scriptures to their own destruction. Uh, Peter links Paul's writings underneath the description of Scripture. So there's a claim and an indication uh, that even these New Testament writings were being viewed as Scripture. Uh, I always have to laugh. I remember Dr. Cairns inter introducing a sermon on that very difficult passage in Peter about uh, the baptism, um, the like figure wherein to baptism doth also now save us. Uh, he said he found it interesting that uh, Peter would make such a statement about Paul's writings in which he's written probably one of the most thorny passages to navigate through in all the New Testament. So, well, who to thunk it? All right, everybody awake? I don't know if I'm going to continue with this uh, light in my eyes if I'm not going to use it or not, but uh, well, I will press on. Um... All right, let's see. I guess that finishes it up on page four. So, over to five. Purpose. The book's addressed to Theophilus to complete the instruction given to him in the former treatise, which is the Gospel of Luke. Certainly it was understood that it would reach far beyond this individual, but in him, that is in Theophilus, we see a representative of the Gentile world and the educated world at that. The description given to him as, quote, most excellent, could be just a polite form of address, the way we would say, sir, or whatever. But it also referred often to one of a higher official or a social position uh, that was higher than that of the speaker. And so it's used to Felix and Hephaestus when we come to those portions um, where these leaders are part of the text. Um, Secondly, an obvious purpose of the book is to supply histor the historical narrative of the work of Christ. One, one of all that Jesus began both to do and teach through the Holy Spirit in the early church, a framework in which the epistles may be placed and understood. In this sense, its great purpose is to record the inauguration of the outworking of the Savior's commission. One, eight. After suggesting that Luke purposed a third volume chronicling the advancement of Christianity unto the ends of the earth, perhaps by recounting the labors of the other apostles, B.B. Warfield states with, re with reference to the purpose of the book, In any event, however, the purpose of the author seems to have been to portray the history of the Christian church as the fulfillment of our Lord's prophetic outline. 
Uh, again, we're going to comment a little later on this proposed third volume that Warfield suggests. But thirdly, there seems to be an apologetic purpose in the book as well. While critical scholars the Spingen School have suggested a second century date and the purpose being to rewrite history and mend an imagined rift between Peter and Paul, the Petrine and Pauline factions of the church, thus making Acts an apologetic work. Well, we obviously don't view, that, view the book in that way. Uh, we don't believe that there was a rift between Peter and Paul and their views of justification. Uh, we don't believe there was that rift in the early church. Um, these scholars are suggesting that Luke was the, the writer of Acts was attempting to bridge this gap. I think if you read the history, uh, there wasn't a gap. Uh, Peter and Paul were on the same page. There were difficulties the New Testament church encountered, and we're going to deal with those as we come along. But um, uh, that is not an apologetic purpose. However, I do believe that we can see, even as conservative believers, an apologetic purpose in Acts for this reason. Luke pays a lot of attention to the legal matters that come into play during Paul's travels. Uh, Paul's in and out of jail pretty frequently, it seems. Uh, it reminds me of uh, some of you fellows that aren't uh, free church guys, but uh, one of the early ministers in the Free Presbyterian Church in Northern Ireland, uh, the Reverend Ivan Foster. He was one of the ministers that was put in jail with Dr. Paisley back in the mid-60s. Uh, if you learn that story, it's a pretty interesting story. They had gotten permission to protest a meeting by the uh, Presbyterian Church of Ireland. They were having a representative from Southern Ireland up. and It was pretty apparent that the liberal politics and the liberal church goings-on were coming together. And uh, protesting this, in many ways, put our church on the map and awakened people in Northern Ireland to the direction of the apostasy there. Uh, going too long into the story, but uh, just to vindicate our men, how they got arrested, they were marching, and they had gotten, much as we do today, a route to march out around a block or a couple block area between the buildings where these meetings were being held by the Presbyterian Church. And uh, everything was above board and fine. Well, at one point, they pulled a rope across, the police pulled a rope across the street to uh, stop the people from marching so that the people in the other meetings could go from one building to the other building across the street. Well, when they pulled the rope across uh, to stop our people and the people's feet stopped moving, they arrested them. They said, this is now an illegal assembly. Um, Pretty neat tactic, isn't it? Uh, so anyway, so the three men that were basically the leaders of that were either told to sign a form that they would no longer hold illegal assemblies or go to jail. I said, I'm not signing that. We haven't held any illegal assemblies. So off to jail they go. Well, anyway, to get back to the part of my story, I was hearing uh, Ivan Foster give his testimony a few years ago, and he was in jail a couple of times. And he was telling about one time he was in, and some really bad fella is getting booked in and put in with him at the same time. And the guy made some comment, and I don't even know if it was about the food or what it was. And Mr. Foster looked at him and said, well, when I was in last time, it was okay. <laughs> I thought, that's just it. You got this really bad criminal there, and the very godly minister sits next to him and says, well, when I was in last time, this is the way it worked. Um, right, what am I saying? Paul was in and out of jail a lot. I do think if we want to see part of Luke's purpose, besides the obvious, uh, to supply the history, that backdrop for the epistles, I do think there's a little bit of an apologetic purpose in, in Acts. Um, Luke pay, takes attention, pays attention, takes time to look at how the Roman authorities interact with Paul. Um, You'll see in the trials uh, that very much paralleled to Christ's trial. The Jews are enraged. Pilate knows that for envy they have delivered him. Uh, and he knows Christ is innocent. Well, Paul is brought on charges by the Jews. 
but then how he's dealt with in the Roman authorities. And it's interesting to start looking at the politics. But I think the apologetic purpose Luke has is to show Rome, civil government, doesn't have anything to fear from the gospel. Um, and I think that's an important thing for us to consider. If I could just pause and come out of teacher mode and get into preacher mode, which I've obviously already done frequently here. Um, what should our mindset be? You know, we're talking about Luke's apologetic purpose. What should the mindset of the authorities be toward us as believers or as preachers or as the church? What should the church's mindset be to these authorities? I think it's a question that's going to come up in your ministries. It's certainly going to come up in your lifetime because it's coming up in mine and I didn't expect it to. But um, we're coming to a point where I think Christians are going to, if not already, aren't agreeing on how to handle civil government. Um, America is changing. America has already radically changed in my lifetime. Um, do we fight that? Or do we go along with it? Um, can we agree to disagree on this question? Um, civil disobedience. If we see in Scripture, it's something at times believers are going to be forced to. We must obey God rather than men. And we see early in Acts an example of that, where the Jewish authorities basically say, stop preaching, stop sharing the gospel, or we're going to lock you up. Okay, lock us up because we're preaching. Um, so that's one reality, that there may be times in which civil authority and the gospel come in conflict, and we have to obey God rather than men. But on the other hand, as Christians, do we go off half-cocked, um, chip on our shoulder, challenging the authorities on every hand? Um, and again, I, I look at America. I'm the kind of guy, I can come to tears uh, singing the national anthem. Uh, I'm very patriotic. I love this country. I, I look at the, in the providence of God, uh, what blessings it's known, and it's wonderful. But is constitutional America a God-given right? Is it the will of God that this constitution is always followed and obeyed, and if the country disobeys it, then as a church, we've got to do something about it. Um, now, th these questions get delicate because what the church does as a church and then what individual believers do and can do as private citizens and as part of a constitutional government and a democratic republic and voting and you know, writing letters to the editor and all these things. Yeah, there's a lot of liberty I think we can have as Christians. And we're burdened if we want to educate people, all of that. But at the end of the day, let's say Congress says we're voting to take this out of the Bill of Rights and we're doing this or we're doing that. Or some coup takes place and we have a dictator. Um, do I have the authority to say this is not God's will and I'm against it. And so I go to jail or I get shot. Um, I as a believer want to go to jail for the gospel and not saying, uh, well, I'm going to be a Republican instead of a Democrat, so you got to lock me up. Um, and these, I'm, I'm rambling, and, but these are difficult questions. But I, but I want to bring it back to relevance here. There's a portion, I think it's mentioned in this lengthy quote here by Manley, but in this apologetic purpose, Luke is saying Rome doesn't have anything to fear from the gospel. And I think this is very relevant when it comes to the debate with these Reconstructionists and the Theonomists. Is the New Testament designed for the church to take over, to take over the Gentile governments and to institute Christian civil government on the Gentile nations or the Gentile peoples. That's not what we see going on in Acts. We see the apostles intermingling with the Gentiles, entering the Gentile nations, abiding by their laws, preaching the gospel, calling people to Christ, and leaving civil matters alone. 
save where they're forced upon them, and then saying, we haven't done anything wrong. Now, Paul does stand up for himself. He's not just a pushover. Uh, I love that section uh, where he says, you know, uh, in Philippi, uh, well, they speak about the Roman citizenship, and then they, they, the authorities learn of it, and they're scared, and they say they send the message, go, let them go, let them go. And I said, no, oh, let them come and get us out. We're not leaving until they get here. Uh, that's beautiful stuff. I think that's wonderful, but it's all within the context of current law. Um, an interesting part that uh, I really had never paid attention to till this time through getting ready for the course, but in Ephesus, when the silversmiths get offended and they start the riot and uh, the people are gathered in that theater, probably the one that's still visible today, just Google Earth right in there, um, there are men that were leaders in Ephesus that were Asiarchs. And that's one of the things Luke's careful along using his titles of the different uh, Roman officers and authorities. These men find Paul because the people are looking for Paul and are trying to get Paul into that mob scene. And they're afraid for Paul, and they're also afraid of what's going to happen if Paul gets there. I mean, the, the thing that's basically turned into a riot would really explode. And so these men get Paul and we want you to go. Don't go in there. Don't do that. These are the civil leaders that are trying to keep Paul from going in there to make things worse. And it says of them who were Paul's friends. So Paul's not this guy going in there with an attitude on his shoulder trying to make the leaders in Ephesus mad. He's made friends with some of these men. And he spends a time period there for about three years. And Ephesus became... I think in many ways, the third outpost for the gospel. One being Jerusalem, two being Antioch, and then in that second journey, Paul spends time in Ephesus at the school of Tyrannus in the afternoons. Uh, we'll get there, uh, talk a little more about that. I always think that's humorous, a school that's named after a guy, Tyrannus, the tyrant. Um, maybe that was the Cairn School of the afternoon or whatever. But uh, you guys had him for a module just the last couple of weeks. Ah, uh, well, you see, I'm Mr. Anticlimactic here, uh, and a real pushover, too. Um, but the point I'm getting at here, these Asiarchs were Paul's friends. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read, um, and I've not been a big reader of biography, but uh, the big two-volume biography of George Whitfield uh, by Arnold Dallimore. Uh, it's a great book, uh, or a great couple of books there, but uh, Mark Allison said that affected him more than anything else he's ever read in his life. Uh, it's a powerful piece of work. Um, but he points out there, there was a great friendship between George Whitfield and Benjamin Franklin. Well, if you know anything about Benjamin Franklin, he wasn't, you know, basically the American saint. Uh, he was an unbeliever, um, not a godly man. But yet Whitfield, when he was in Philadelphia preaching, would stay in Franklin's home. Uh, Franklin, and uh, Dalmore points out in the book, there's a point in uh, Whitfield's ministry, one of the historical niceties of Whitfield is probably Whitfield preached to larger crowds than anybody in history without electronic amplification. Uh, and Franklin was so impressed at one point Whitfield's preaching in Philadelphia that he walked off a, a radius, a straight line from where Whitfield was preaching to a point down one street after the crowd had thinned and he got to the point where he couldn't hear Whitfield anymore. He, he, he got the furthest point where he could discern everything Whitfield was saying and then he did the math to figure out how many people could fit in that circle. And I forget the number, but it was a huge number. But I mean, this is the kind of relationship that Franklin and Whitfield had. Now, to me, that's the kind of thing where the offense of the cross is real. The offense of the doctrines of the gospel are very real. They're professing Christians that are offended by stuff that we teach here at Geneva. <laughs> uh, what of the ungodly? Let the offense come from the truth and not from our attitude coming in half-cocked, coming in anticipating the worst, coming in anticipating that the leaders of our city or whatever are going to be our enemies. They may be, as Paul found in Ephesus, his friends. Uh, and yes, when push comes to shove, some of these people are going to show their colors and their realities. That's why the um, 
I, I think it's interesting when you see this situation some of these people are put into, like Pilate. Be very careful here because now I am being recorded, but I was preaching to my people at home and I said I've got a little note in my sermon file, the to-be-preached file of stuff that will probably never be preached, um, of a sermon or at least some thoughts in defense of Pilate. Um, now, let me qualify this in a great way. Pilate was wrong. He did evil. And he knew he was doing wrong. But when he made that statement, what is truth? You put that in the context. Here is a politician, a pragmatist, a Roman officer, a Roman political leader. He's in charge of one of the hot spots of all things, the Middle East. And he needs to keep the peace. He needs to keep riots from happening. Here these Jews are all stirred up. And look, they know it's a hot spot. And they come in there. We have no king but Caesar. We love you, Romans. And Pilate's in there. Right. What's coming up now? And they bring Christ. He examines him. This man's not guilty. He knows for envy. They've delivered him. Pilate in the middle of it says, what's truth? It's not the way the world works. The world doesn't work according to truth. You've got to just... You know, you've got to keep all the balls in the air and balance everything. And you know what's going to happen in this region if I turn you loose and all of the political pragmatism. Well, there are realities that are in play. And we need the wisdom to know when we work within those things, like Paul, not stirring up trouble for the Romans where he went. But then when the gospel and others, because of the gospel, start the trouble, I mean, Paul didn't start the riots where there were riots. The people who hated Paul started the riots and blamed him for them. Well, what do the Romans do in such a situation? It's a tangled web. But uh, anyway, that's a long uh, sidelight there, a little bit of preaching, but uh, the apologetic purpose. I think that you see the importance that Luke places on explaining Every time there was an altercation between the authorities and the apostles, Luke wants to give those details so that the gospel is vindicated, that the apostles themselves are vindicated. They're not troublemakers, and the Gentile governments don't have anything to fear from this gospel. Uh, and that's true. Um, so I think it's something that at least we need to have in mind as we progress in our times. Um, Okay, well, we've got a few more minutes before our 10.30 break here. Bottom of page 5, structure. There's some obvious structural marks in the book of Acts. The book may be divided into two sections, and we can see those as the Peter section and the Paul section. Peter is dominant in chapters 1 to 12, and Paul's the dominant character in chapters 13 to 28. Um, also keeping these two divisions, we see Jerusalem as the center for the first section, and Antioch as the center for the second section. Now, I mentioned to you before, um, Antioch really is the center for the last half of the book. Antioch, in many ways, is the model church. It's the missionary church. It was Paul's base of operations. It's the church that sent out Paul and Barnabas and Paul uh, and the later journeys. Um, but we'll come along as we get into it. Ephesus, uh, it wasn't a mother, well, it was a mother church, but it wasn't one of these two centers as Jerusalem and Antioch. But I really think the season Paul spent in Ephesus was significant uh, change or a significant development uh, in the progress of the gospel. Uh, Paul had a peaceful season uh, in Ephesus up until that time where the silversmiths were concerned about losing money because too many people were getting saved um, and started things, started the trouble. Uh, we can also uh, divide the book in a threefold way from Jerusalem, uh, and that's according to the obvious key verse, Acts 1.8. Uh, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Um, 
So if you want to take that, there's a threefold outline, chapters 1 to 7 then being witnessing in Jerusalem, chapters 8 to 12 being witnessing in Samaria and Judea, uh, and chapters 13 to 28 being witnessing unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now we get into something we've hinted at uh, already. Many have noted that the book seems to come to an abrupt end. And some, as we've seen, have even suggested that yet a third treatise was planned by Luke. Warfield suggests this in selected shorter writings, and he argues that Luke isolates three great centers for the advancement of Christianity, Jerusalem, Antioch, and finally Rome. The second treatise on this view takes up the establishment of the center in Rome, but doesn't elaborate that recording waiting the third treatise. But this does not accord well with the other aspect of Warfield's suggestion that the third treatise would possibly have chronicled the activities of the other apostles. Uh, you see what we're saying here, Warfield's suggesting Luke planned a third volume and it was going to use Rome as a center. But I think Warfield's almost contradicted himself. I'm shaking saying these things about Warfield. Um, because he's saying Luke was going to take up the work of the other apostles that really kind of fall off the map in Acts. Uh, well, if that's the case, then Rome's not going to be the center because Rome was where Paul went. Uh, the other apostles went other places. So uh, I don't think those two things jive. Um, anyway, but uh, our views, if I could suggest here, uh, on inspiration, the completion of the canon, the perfection of the word, the preservation of the word, at least to me, give us pause here. I don't like the suggestion that uh, there was going to be another book of the Bible, but it just didn't happen. Uh, I'm a little iffy on the suggestion about other epistles. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Corinthian correspondence. Uh, most modern scholars think that what we have as 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians, and what we have as 2 Corinthians is really 4 Corinthians. I'm a little dicey on that, and uh, Dr. Cairns was pretty vocal on that when we went through the epistles under him. Um, I won't get into that, but uh, I just I have paused in suggesting that there's another book of the Bible that we didn't get. Um, so, I'd say we must take note of the fact that the book begins in Jerusalem and ends with the great apostle to the Gentiles arriving in Rome, the capital of the world. We might add, the rest is history. So, the fact that Luke brings us to Rome and leaves Paul there, Rome being the goal, the center of the Gentile world, and the place from which, uh, in a greater way than even the other centers that he had established along the way, uh, I think that it's a very fitting ending. Uh, it's not an abrupt ending that leaves us hanging and we don't know what else happened. Uh, I think it's a very appropriate ending. And even if it does seem abrupt, that Luke writes and brings us up to the very time of the writing, I think answers the abruptness and the fact that Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, has arrived in Rome. It's a very fitting place to end. So I, I don't uh, go along with the fact that something else was supposed to come that we didn't get.